This program was funded in part by a generous grant from the Greater Montana Foundation and Salish Kootenai College. Each of us is part of a sacred circle, a segment of the great hoop of life. Our grandfathers and their grandfathers live on in us, and like other pieces of a circle, we lean on others to make us whole. Life is movement and change, but it is also geography. Where we are is often a big part of who we are. When the circle of life is incomplete, one of the greatest things we miss is our sense of belonging. Belonging to a place as well as to a people. And some of us feel that loss more than others. Throughout the military history of the world is the untold legacy of children who were left behind by their soldier fathers. Unable to care for their children, the unwed mothers who fell in love with their soldier fathers sent many of these children to orphanages. Grandparents, older siblings, and other family members raised others. The sadness and uncertainty for these children follows them throughout their lives as they search for their true identity. I had just completed my research with my father's family history. He is a South Sea Islander. I felt that in order for the family history to be complete, I had to do my mother's history as well. And then I became ill in 96. I was uh, very ill. I had a brain hemorrhage and, um, and that pulled me up. It stopped me dead in my tracks. And um, my mother and my husband Robert and my dad helped me. They nursed me back to what you see today. Um, it was at that time that I made the decision that I need to research my mother's history, research her dad, research his people, and complete it, not leave it unfinished. And when I first broached the topic with mum, I started and I asked her whether she knew who her father was. And she said, no, I don't. And it was then that she started to weep. Um, and I cried too because I thought, I realised she had a void or a hole in her identity that needed to be healed. Uh, my earliest childhood memories would have to be when I went to, sc to a school in Mackay, uh, which was called the Marion School. Uh, I lived in Mackay with my natural mother and my stepfather at that time. Uh, and then after that I can remember living with my grandparents at a little South Sea Islander co community called Joskali. Um, the South Sea Islanders are descendants uh, who were brought out to Australia in the late 1800s. Um, the South Sea Islanders are um, people who were brought out from the New Hebrides, which is called Vanuatu today, and um, they were brought out here as slaves. It was called the Black, uh, they were called the Blackbirders. And um, they were brought out here to work in the sugar and the cattle industry. Uh, I was raised by my grandparents, who were really uh, caring, loving, Parents, they were really. I, I look. They were my mum and dad. I called them mum and I called them uh, dad. I can remember going to the little school 
in Joskali with my friends who were all my cousins. I used to get angry because I had straight hair. So all the other South Sea Islanders had their thick, frizzy, curly hair. And um, with the frizzy hair, you could do anything with it. You could plait it, braid it, tie it up, wear flowers in it, whereas with the straight hair, you couldn't do that. I don't know whether it was just a South Sea Islander thing or not, but uh, children born out of wedlock were never talked about like who their fathers were, yeah, and I, I didn't ask. I believe those values are British values. Um, in the South Sea Islander community that mum was raised in and that we kept contact with and that we still go back to today and, um, and walk on the soil, um, I believe that those values were um, imposed on South Sea Islander people. You had to adopt those values to survive in Queensland. We learnt about the 41st Division that came to Rockhampton, but we still didn't know anything about who Mum's father really was. And um, then I realised that we've kind of exhausted all of the resources that we had in Rockhampton and I said to mum I think now is the time to talk to the people to talk to the people who may have known um, who her dad was a lot of the people had died those that were left they could not recall who he was or they did not know who he was at some point we ended up speaking with Uncle Ben, who, who said to us um, that his mum, Auntie Eve, um, an elder in the community, um, knew who mum's dad was. And so when we got to Uncle Ben's at Joskalee, he was walking out onto his veranda. We were waiting on the veranda, seated there. And he said, well, I've got some very disappointing news. And I thought, oh my goodness, no. Oh, I thought, you know, I, I don't know. I was just afraid, I guess, that he wasn't able to help us. And he, he just said, well, mum doesn't remember. And he said, but I remember. So there's about 40,000 soldiers trained here. And so many came at a time. There might have been 5,000 or so in the mob. Nearly every home ironed clothes for the soldiers. And they charged them for that, I know that. Yeah, they had to have their clothes ironed up. See, Mum should have known, mm -hmm. but she couldn't remember. I said, you should remember, Mum, you cooked for these men. No, she couldn't remember no one's name. Oh, they were just soldiers to her. Then I got to thinking then. Well, there's only one Indian amongst them. And I could remember plainly they used to call him Little Son. They never called him Alfred. Yeah, well, Mum was funny like that. She wouldn't, didn't want to remember anything, eh? Mm -hmm. That was the South Sea Island idea. <laughs> yeah. They wouldn't tell you nothing. Yeah, I think she must have known, but she wouldn't say. Mm -hmm. All the other fellows call him Little Son. That's how I come to remember it, eh? Your dad's Little Son. He's an American Indian, and he used to visit my dad and my mum at their farm, and he loved our horses. He loved our horses that much, he used to ride them. 
and mum even used to iron his shirts and mum used to cook him fried chicken and m make mulberry wine and they were his favourite and he would bring Helene, who was mum's natural mother. Yeah, I could remember Alfred drinking wine <laughs> and his friends reckon he was greedy <laughs> because he'd never let his glass go empty. As soon as he got down a bit, he'd fill it up again. I can remember that as plain as anything. Oh, he is the only living person today that knew my father, Alfred Littleson. And um, he, on the night before he was um, shipped out to New Guinea, he and my mother Helene had dinner at, they put on a special dinner at Auntie Eve's house. I tried to research Mum's dad using the white system. I got nowhere. I knew that in order for us to find Mum's dad, we had to use the Indian network. It's that way in Australia. The Aboriginal network is very, very strong. We call it the, the Aboriginal message stick. Networks, you could be a continent. Our continent is quite, quite big. You could live in one part of the continent and your brothers, sisters, relatives live in another part, but you still stay connected. The distance does not matter. And I thought, it's like that way here. I believe that's the case in all Earth cultures. And so I thought, let's try the Indian way. At Salish Kootenai College on the Flathead Indian Reservation for about five years. And a colleague of mine, Eber, Dr. Eberhard Wenzel, who was teaching public health at Griffith University, was interested in Indigenous health. And he asked me to come over and do some work and share ideas with uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands, with uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island health folks who are pretty much like the Indian Health Service on reservations. Rockhampton was the last place that I was going to meet people. And Mark Warcon was the director. And he called his sister and brother-in-law, Deanne and Robert Toby, and he told them to come over. And he said, there's a native woman here who's talking to us. And we'd like you to come over and share the history of Aboriginal people here in Rockhampton. So Robert came over with his wife, Deanne, and they brought a map. And he told me all about the history of the Aboriginal people in Rockhampton. And he gave me a flag, the Aboriginal flag. And he also gave me a beautiful painting that his sister had done. And it's called Traditional Hunting, and it's a point painting. And I had no gifts left to bring. And the last thing I had to give was a ring that my husband, Frank, had loaned me. And I took it off the cord that it was hanging on, it was around my neck and I gave it to Deanne. I'm a big believer of um, the verse in the Bible, in Ecclesiastes, that things happen in their time. The season has to be right. It will not happen before or after. It has to happen in the right time. And I believe that none of us was ready including Laurie, before that time. I think all the players had to be moved into place because Laurie found Mum's dad within two weeks and that was the Indian way. A few months after I got back, I got an email from Deanne and she wrote to me she said, we've been looking for my grandpa, and we've been looking for 50 years, and can you help us find him? And we just found out that his name was Little Son, and we know that he's an American Indian, but we don't know what his tribe is or where he lived or whatever, anything about him. 
and because I had just done the genealogy of my own family and I knew our whole genealogy, I said to her, sure, I can find him. I know I can find him. It may take a long time, but I definitely can find him. So the first thing I did, I went to the archives of the military whether Mr. Little's son had made it through the war alive. And I went state by state looking for that name. And I looked in all 50 states, and there was no death of a little son. So I knew that he made it. The next thing I did was I looked on the internet, on the white pages, for the phone numbers of all the little sons all over the country. And I found a handful, maybe 15. And I called them all up one Sunday morning. And some of them were in Oklahoma because the Cheyenne, the Southern Cheyenne are there and the Pawnee are there. And I asked them, did you have a relative who fought in New Guinea and trained in Australia? And nobody did. And there was one phone number in Montana, Coldstrip, Montana, which is right near the Northern Cheyenne Reservation. But I, when I called there, the number was out of service. And I had students who were Northern Cheyenne, and they went back to the reservation. And so I called them up and I said, do you know a man, a soldier who fought in World War II, who fought in New Guinea, who lived in Australia for a time, whose last name was Little Son? And the student who I called said, sure, I know who that family is. In fact, my cousin was married to his son. And I got really excited then. And she said, but we've lost track of the family. We don't know where he is. So my student told me I was looking for Alfred Little Son, and she told me that he had died, and she had lost track of that family. And I was able to speak to Al Jean, and Al Jean told me that he had a brother who lived in Shelton, Washington. And I called his brother, and, I, and he told me that his name was Austin. And I told him, I said to Austin, you have a sister in Australia, and she's been looking for you, and her name is Evelyn Stella. And there was complete silence at the end of the line. And he was just stunned. And he didn't know, you know, he didn't know what to say. And he said, I know that name. I had a sister named Evelyn, and she's dead. Is this my sister come back from the dead? And I said, no, she's alive and she lives in Australia, and she wants to call you. And I asked him if that was okay. And then when I got off the phone, I called Deanne. And I was kind of hesitant to do that because it was five o'clock in the morning in Australia. But I did it anyways. And she found, found Alfred Little Son. She didn't email me, and that was good. She, um, she rang me up and it was something like five o'clock in the morning and that's early for me and um, she just said I've found your mum's dad I have found your mum's father and w I can recall hearing Laurie weeping um, because then I began to weep and it was very emotional well you can imagine what it was like like when I told her, told mum um, because she 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 started to cry and I could hear her crying on the phone and I thought my goodness me um, she's found her father and there were so many challenges in the whole process and um, I thought this would be like um, the wound healing and um, she shared that with the rest of our family then we organized a, a meeting and she told her children it was really a, an emotional thing that meeting it was hard because um, we all had to come together and show our true feelings that's what that allowed it allowed us to do that that was good for our family. That sort of was, I think, still part of that healing that wound. It needed to happen. We all needed to, to go through that. I think the, the ones we have to thank for this whole thing would be Laurie, who was brought to us. And I think she was brought to us for this. And our uncle Ben, because without those two, this 
thing would never have happened, I don't think, because Deanne had tried before that and nothing seemed to have, oh, it didn't sort of get anywhere. After um, a series of phone calls and emails, uh, Mum had made the decision that she was going, going to travel to America, she was going to go to the reservation and she was going to go to the cemetery. I didn't look on it as a big problem. It was just something that I had to do and I was going to do it no matter what. So this whole thing, I think, started back in Mum's childhood. And over the years, whether she realised it or not, it was passed on to us. Because I realised last year, when we found our grandfather, that not only myself, but Debbie and Mark and Nelson and Darren were feeling the void there. So I, I believe it was passed on to us. It isn't just about my mum looking for her dad. And it's not about me or my brothers or sister looking for their grandfather. It's about helping to heal a wound that opened up way back, way back there in the in the 1940s. The smoke of war that blew across most of the world in 1941 came from fires that had started much earlier in the grasslands of Manchuria in 1937 and the forests of Poland in 1939. America had watched across two oceans and wished it would all just go away. On the Northern Cheyenne Indian Reservation in Montana, Alfred Littleson's people had smelled the smoke of burning national ambitions before. They knew all too well that destiny doesn't hesitate at mountains or prairies or even oceans. Only a couple of generations separated their young warriors from the ones who had fought Yellow Hair Custer and Bear Coat Miles and a whole series of invading armies. Alfred's grandfather, Samuel Littleson, had been one of those warriors. Samuel fought for our very existence at the Custer fight, as the Cheyennes called it. If he and others hadn't fought for the Indians and survived, Alfred would not have been able to fight in New Guinea for American freedom. Now Alfred was being asked to fight for freedom and against oppression but as part of the same army that had relocated his family and friends and taken their land. In March of 1942, Alfred Littleson was a soldier in the 1st United States Army Division to be shipped to the South Pacific. He traveled on a luxury liner, Queen Elizabeth, which had been converted to carry troops. A month later, he was in Australia and soon learning jungle warfare at Camp Caves near Rockhampton in central Queensland. The area was known as the Sand Hills, also the name of a sacred place in Nebraska revered by Northern Cheyenne people who are also known as the Sand Hills Men. Alfred and his division fought a brutal campaign in New Guinea, returned to Rockhampton for rest then joined the invasion of the Philippines. He never went back to Australia. In uh, World War II, the men in their everyday traditional life, uh, and I, when I say traditional life, their life as a Cheyenne, revolved around a man being a warrior a man being able to say maybe he rode in and he touched an enemy an enemy that meant to kill you but he didn't kill him uh, counting a coup and then maybe killing an enemy uh, 
and maybe taking a scalp. These men weren't that far removed. Uh, 70 years, 1876, um, the Battle of the Little Bighorn. So we're talking in 1940s then. And some of these men were just freshly told from their grandparents and things about the Battle of the Little Bighorn. There was a large number of Northern Cheyennes that were, went to war in World War II. And what I would share about it is that, you know, I've listened to some of them that said when they came home, they went into the hills and they burned all those clothes and all those medals and all those papers. That's how it affected them. These were real traditional Cheyenne-speaking, living men who went to this war to fight for this country. And only God knows what it did to them inside their hearts and in their minds. There was just a whole lot of conflicts of, of trying to catch up with the world. And that's the life Alfred came from and went into an, another turmoil of its own. But I heard of this child, but only in the presence of alcohol. When he was feeling bad, his moods were swinging from sad times to good times to death times to his whole span then of the war was intertwined with that. In 1966, 67, I became a police officer. And uh, again, I was still in contact with Alfred off and on. Um, sometimes just with traditional storytelling, um, and then sometimes professionally because I was a police officer. He liked horses, um, he liked hunting, he liked, uh, he liked his grandchildren. Um, and he used to just like to tell, um, he's, well, and, and I guess to put it in the words that make it understandable for me is, uh, he would tell war stories to the societies, and uh, I listened, you know, to those things. Uh, he went through quite a lot while he was in the army. Um, so these are the things, um, I guess maybe combat veterans pass things back and forth. Just about all the stories involved New Guinea and uh, the hardships and the times, uh, the Philippines and the times there. His whole life after was still revolved around World War II. He said it many times, cried many times, but usually when he was under the influence of alcohol or something. This is when he would talk and I would be there. Uh, I was either arresting him or I was sitting up with him, going through withdrawals of alcoholism, and just being a veteran, taking care of a veteran. When I called Deanne and told her that her mother had a brother that she never even knew she had here in America, and that Austin didn't really know that he had a sister in Australia either, and they started emailing each other, and they started calling each other, and they made plans to come to America. And it was a big deal for them to come to America because it was right after the 911 tragedy and people didn't want to travel. But Evelyn was strong and she really wanted to come to see where her dad's land was and to visit his grave and to meet her family and to come over. And they made plans to come over to America in 2002. And Frank and I had made plans to go to Vancouver to meet them. And it's about 12 hours from where we live in Montana to drive to Vancouver. 
and Austin was supposed to go and meet them too at the airport, but he forgot his ID and they wouldn't let him into Canada. And so Frank and I were the only ones there to meet them. And the plane was five hours late. And when they finally came off the international arrivals ramp, we were crying and screaming. And I said to Evelyn, Austin isn't here. They wouldn't let him in the country because he didn't have an ID. And she said, oh my God, Lori, thank God you're here. What would we have done if you weren't here? And I had dreams of Austin and Evelyn meeting at the airport and hugging each other like Miss Piggy and Froggy and Kermit. And it didn't happen like that. They met in a dark old gas station in Shelton, Washington in the middle of the night, around midnight. And everyone was crying and we were crying. Austin drove up in a little station wagon uh, with uh, all his most of his children and his wife and yeah I was just glad to see him see him in person and to hug him and touch him yeah and um, uh, I knew he'd sort of turn up the way he did dressed in his jeans and cowboy hat with this big long plait hanging at the back of his head, you know. It's just, it was just sort of what I expected him to look like. <laughs> I said, we see each other for the first time, you know, and I was, I'm so happy. Yeah. When we got home to Austin's house, we sat down for a few minutes and talked. He probably knew what to name a girl, and would they, they probably talked about it before. And then when he came back to the United States, you know, I don't remember him talking about it that he had a daughter there, or that he was expecting a daughter or whatever. I don't. Maybe he didn't even know himself. He talked about Australia a lot. You know, that's the only thing that I can remember. And plus what you had to do in the islands there. Austin had already told me that my father had another daughter before him and her name was Evelyn Stella and she lived for a short time and had passed away. So there was something special about that name. Looked like me. <laughs> She was my sister. I, I know I always said my angel <laughs> because she came back. I mean, that's the way I always thought about it because I never knew the one that died because she died before I was born, you know. And That's just the way I felt. So I never really had no doubts. I always, first time I talked to her, it was, I knew there was no question. I remember getting the call. It's Evelyn. And because that was my, when that was told to me, It was like a, oh, my sister came back, you know, like a, like a feeling of, because she was older than I. And whatever my dad must have knew, or he must have talked about it someplace along the line, because when she, when he had a daughter, he named her the same name. Austin left the room and went into his bedroom and he came out with a, a special gift that I didn't expect to get. And it was, it was our dad's flag 
and um, it had been given to him. But he said because I was the eldest in the family, he gave that flag to me and I thought that was something. Because he didn't have to do that, I wouldn't have known any better. I gave Austin a little, uh, it was just a little bag type thing, uh, covered in beads, and it had um, soil from Joscally in that little bag. And I hung it around his neck and told him that was soil from Joscally where his father had been and stood on and where my mother and I had lived. Well, when we pulled up right beside the grave and didn't realise it was just there, um, when we started to walk around and look for the grave, I felt sort of a sadness come over my heart. And um, I was just, I was thinking to myself, I was a bit sad because I hadn't got to meet him. Oh, um, no, I can't. Um, hug him, or talk to him, all the things that fathers and daughters do. And it was, I felt sad. Yeah, I felt sad at that time. Yes, when Shiny did the ceremony, I believe that it brought us, Deanne and myself and Shiny, closer together. You know, it made us... I think it helped her a lot because she talked about what she used to do to her grandfather and the little tricks she used to play on him by pulling his hat off his head and running away with it and different little stories she told there. Maybe she never ever told them to anybody else, you know, and they're the special little stories that I'll treasure. Roger Oldmouse said, we have a lady here from Australia. And those of you who knew New Guinea little son, this is his daughter from Australia. And you please come out and shake her hand. And you please come out and shake her hand and welcome her to her homeland. Thank you, uh, Herb. I'd like to talk to all of you people, which I am going to do here just very shortly. But you know, along with all these sad times and different things, we also got a lot of happy times. I was fortunate enough today to meet a lady from Australia. She's a daughter of Alfred Littleson. Along with her is her daughter. Her name is Dee, and her husband are here. They spent a lot of years trying to find where Alfred Littleson was from. They completed their search. They met Austin Littleson out in Washington, and now this family has made a trip to Northern Cheyenne country. They made a visit to Alfred's grave, and they just wanted to see where her dad and the young lady's grandpa is from. Those of you that are related to the little sins, maybe you can come and acknowledge this is part of your family from down under. And I'm going to have another granddaughter of Alfred introduce them. I kind of have a tough time with their name. How's that? Tiny. This is the daughter of Alfred, my aunt. Her name's Evelyn. Evelyn Stella. Her daughter, my cousin, her name is Deanna, the color D. And 
And then her husband, Robert. Okay, we just wanted to take a few minutes of your time to show these people her, their extended family. So those of you that have time, this is, the, this is the daughter of Alfred Littleson and his granddaughter and the husband of the granddaughter. But these is part of the Littleson family. So those of you that have time and would like to acknowledge that family, please come forward. Thank you very much. I knew Indians were Indians and I only thought of them as just with feathers on their head, you know, the, and um, yeah, it really opened my eyes when I saw all these uh, different outfits and that they wore. And I, they were just beautiful. First and time I've ever spoken to Indian people and it, it was all, all new, all new to me. I wanted to see everything at once. Yeah, my eyes were everywhere. I wanted to look at this dancer and that dancer. And, and yeah. there was, then there was people there that, you know, we thought looked like mm, our people, <laughs> my children. Yeah. And I just stood there. And I watched all the people come to, to meet Evelyn. And I thought, if I never do anything else in my life, I've done this to bring this family together. And that's a great thing. So, sort of, oh, like I was at home when people started to come and, and hug me and shake my hand and I felt as though I was one of them. They'd accepted me. And I didn't feel uh, sort of, I was a bit scared before that because I was wondering if they'd accept me because, you know, 59 years is a long time and Australia is a long way away. Entering the armed forces is harmonious with the culture and lifestyle of many American Indians in terms of being a warrior, protecting homelands, and giving of oneself to tribe and community. No group that participated in World War II made a greater per capita contribution than Native Americans, and none was changed more by the war. On Memorial Day in 2005, the people of the Northern Cheyenne Reservation came together for a parade and memorial service in Lame Deer. Among the speakers was Roger Oldmouse. We had a veteran among us by the name of Alfred Littleson. Anybody remember Mr. Littleson? I guess we're fortunate enough right now that we have a grandson of Mr. Littleson and he's from Australia. And those of you that remember Mr. Littleson probably remember the name of New Guinea. And that was the moniker that we used to identify Mr. Littleson. And just a couple of days ago, his grandson from Australia, Queensland, Australia to be exact, came back to this reservation to see his grandfather's roots. And uh, those people that are related to Alfred would be nice to acknowledge to this man. And his name is Mark. Warcon, Mark Warcon, the daughter 
of Mr. Littleson came here a couple years ago from Australia. And then now the children are making journeys into the state and they're all coming to the Cheyenne Reservation. So when you get, it, get an opportunity, welcome Mr. Warcon. Basically, he's coming home. It wasn't. It wasn't a complete circle. It's like a, a link in a chain. Once it's it's broken, you got to find out how to to join it up again. Uh, the exciting bit for me coming here on this visit was actually to um, pay respect to my grandfather and uh, actually visit and walk in the, the country he was actually born in. I've met, I've met lots of people here over the last couple of weeks and you know the, the things they've said to me and the way they've invited me in and talked to me about various aspects of cultural lifestyle as well as my grandfather's um, family and his lifestyle. It's, uh, it fills a big hole in, 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 a, in a gap that I had in my life. To look across that cemetery and see all those other graves there too as well and they're not really knowing which particular grave um, was grandfather's because there was all the headstones were the same colour and the same shape and there was grass growing in a, on a number of them and uh, once we actually found it it, um, it was a bit overwhelming. Uh, to actually stand there at the foot of his grave. Uh, I could see the pain in Shiny's heart too as well that was as she was standing there beside us and I felt the same way. And you know for guys sometimes it's a bit hard to cry and it's a bit hard to show your, your, your feelings up front in front of other people but uh, it put a lump in my throat too as well. And at least I can say to my mob back home that he lives in, he's where he lived and where he passed away and where they buried him is in a beautiful place. And uh, yeah, it's something that, yeah, it, once again, it's something that you, you, you just can't forget. It's that moment in time when you, um, it's like a, a, a photograph, it, it, it's set in place. To be the oldest grandson of Alfred Littleson, I, I think it's my duty or role to play my part in his history, even though he's not here with us. But I think it's going to be another very exciting part of my life, which, you know, then leads me into another stage as a man and not just a, a man that has no cultural information or law, but a man who knows who he is and where he's going and what his roles and responsibilities are. But I think that if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here, you know? None of us would be here. We wouldn't have what we have. We wouldn't have, have established ourselves, you know. You made a big difference in a lot of people's lives. I think we're lucky because we didn't just have two sets of grandparents. We've had double sets. And I don't think anyone can tell you any different. So I'm proud to say that um, I have a grandpa who lived on the Northern Cheyenne Res, that we have relatives over here. Um, I am proud that we have, um, we were, uh, we, we had a nan and a granddad who raised, raised my mum. I'm proud that I have Nan Gray, um, because she too was part of our lives. So, um, there are no rules or boundaries it's 
It's up to you. It's up to you to make sense of it all. It's closure with my dad because I know now who he is and who he was and I've been to the cemetery but I also know now that I have an extended family. I have, I have a big family now. And I don't want it to be five more years, you know, five years later and then you meet again and you got all these kids and then, you know, ten more years later they got kids, you know, <laughs> and it's like, well, everyone's grown up too fast. Well, it's been ten years. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, I don't want it to be that way either. I didn't think the distance and the, the communication was going to be um, an issue. It hadn't, we hadn't really factored it in, but we've realised now that, that those two things are um, critical to the whole um, process of growing as a family together from now and into the future. Our family has accepted that, that that's going to be the barrier, but that if we want to continue to grow as a family, we have to really do work a little bit harder than, um, say, if you're living in the one country. Yes, I believe we'll survive, as Cheyenne down here, I mean. We won't live in North America because this is our home. Yeah, I believe we'll survive. And um, the, it, it's good in that the um, islanders from our communities, they're, they're sort of learning about it too now. Mm. And so it's becoming a part of the island history as well, that, that like we've got Amber Mees in us or whatever other islands in us, but we've also got Cheyenne in us and others are learning about this. Uncle Austin used to say to us, when you see the hawk, think of us. Think of the little sons. Think of Grandpa Alfred. He used to say, look for the hawk. Just look for the hawk. So that's what we do. We look for the hawk. I'm a Northern Cheyenne. I'm a Northern Cheyenne. But I'm also a South Sea Islander as well. Our grandfathers and their grandfathers live on in us. And like other pieces of a circle, we lean on others to make us whole. Nima tistaman, Nima wohas dohtiman, Nimit ma mehet siman, Nako na nako e, Tihishia was demon, Hit the tipiva, Dakat nimit nishiak nim.